participants will be redirected to an evaluation and to information on how to obtain continuing education credits. I'm delighted today to be joined by Dr. Jeremy Richards, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and a critical care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Thank you, Dr. Richards, for joining us today, and we'll turn it over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Tucker. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here. I am uh, going to go ahead and share my slides here. Uh, we're going to go through a fair amount of information uh, regarding COVID-19 and, and the management of critically ill patients with COVID-19 in the intensive care unit. This talk, this session, is a continuation, uh, a second part, if you will, of a talk uh, that we did a couple of weeks ago um, that is also available uh, online for review if you're so interested. As Dr. Tucker said, uh, I'm a clinician, uh, uh, an intensivist uh, at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And as you can potentially tell from uh, my attire, I am currently on service in the intensive care unit, taking care of critically ill patients with COVID-19. I was lucky enough to get a little bit of coverage to be able to be here with you uh, all today to go through uh, a variety of topics related to COVID-19 in the intensive care unit. Um, it's important, I think, uh, to uh, acknowledge that I have no disclosures that are relevant to this talk, financial or otherwise. Uh, this is uh, a talk from the literature that's available about COVID-19, as well as our own clinical experience here at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. In terms of what we're going to go through in the next hour or so, I have four different objectives that I'd like to uh, be able to try to tackle. Specifically, we're going to talk about remdesivir, uh, which has been in the news and in the journals recently uh, as a potential treatment for COVID-19. We're going to revisit hydroxychloroquine, which we've all heard about a lot over the past several weeks and months, um, and for which there was a very recent randomized controlled trial that was published that shed some light some light on the appropriateness or lack thereof of using hydroxychloroquine for our critically ill patients with COVID-19. We're going to go through fluid management. This is particularly important as our patients have long ICU courses and are subjected to a fair amount of fluid during those courses, as well as a fair amount of our uh, patients suffering acute renal failure. Uh, in the prior talk, I mentioned that around 5% of patients with COVID-19 developed acute renal failure. Certainly based on our lived experience in the case series, many more of the critically ill patients, a much higher proportion than 5%, develop acute renal failure, uh, and as such are frequently subjected to fluid, and we need to think intelligently about how to diurese or manage that fluid, and we'll go through that in some detail uh, partway through the talk. We're going to talk about post-extubation complications. As our patients make it through their critical uh, illness, as they get through the need to uh, be mechanically ventilated, eventually we're going to extubate them, and they are at risk for some specific uh, and potentially morbid post-extubation complications, and we'll go through that in some detail. Finally, uh, we've all noted that these patients tend to be quite hypercoagulable, which is not uncommon in severe septic shock, um, and we're seeing quite frequently in our patients with COVID-19 and multi-organ system failure. And we'll go through what we know, or at least what we think we know, about the role of anticoagulation for these patients. I will warn you that this last part, the systemic anticoagulation for COVID-19, is essentially a data-free zone. Um, and a lot of what uh, we are going to go through is based on guidelines rather than uh, evidence. But we'll start with the first question, specifically focusing on remdesivir. And as I go through the questions uh, for this talk, uh, if there's things that you would like to have clarified or uh, extra questions, um, please feel free to uh, use the chat function. Um, we'll try to address what we can uh, uh, at the end of the talk uh, in terms of relevant uh, clarifications, et cetera. Um, as I go through these questions as well, I'll have intermittent images from recent patients uh, who have been in the intensive care unit at BIDMC, uh, demonstrating different radiologic manifestations of their lung pathology. Again, the primary cause of them needing to be in the intensive care unit. But first question, is remdesivir effective for treatment, treatment for COVID-19? Um, there we go. So what is remdesivir? 
So it's actually a prodrug, which is interesting, and it's metabolized intracellularly uh, to an ATP analog that's referred to as remdesivir triphosphate. And what happens to that ATP analog is that when the virus starts to replicate uh, and it needs some fuel, some building blocks for its RNA, it will take up RDV, TP, or remdesivir triphosphate, include it into that RNA strand that it's building, and that will actually result in termination of replication. Uh, it'll cause the viral replication to, to stop, uh, disrupting the, the proliferation of the virus within the cells. And it turns out that this works. So remdesivir triphosphate or remdesivir has been very effective in vitro in terms of blocking cellular replication. So there's a plausible mechanism by which remdesivir could be effective for patients in vivo uh, who have COVID-19. So there was a recent study that we're going to go through about remdesivir uh, that was published in the New England Journal uh, about two weeks ago on uh, April 10th. And what happened in the study uh, was that remdesivir was provided on a compassionate use basis uh, by the pharma called, by the uh, pharma company that creates uh, that produces remdesivir, uh, Gilead specifically, uh, and they reported the outcomes for 53 patients who were provided remdesivir. And these patients uh, had to be hypoxemic, so they had a low oxygen saturation on ambient air, or they were were, were requiring supplemental oxygen. They had to have uh, functional kidneys, so their creatinine clearance uh, had to be at least greater than 30 mils per minute. And they couldn't have significant hepatic injury, which in your experience, possibly, and certainly in my experience, we definitely see uh, some direct liver injury from sepsis and COVID-19. So keeping an eye on the, the transaminases was an important component of this study methodology. And then finally, the patients who were enrolled in this study who received compassionate use remdesivir could not be receiving any other study drugs. So sorilumab has been studied, tocilizumab we've talked about uh, as potential uh, therapy. Um, they could not be receiving convalescent plasma, et cetera. So they had to be on no other medications uh, that were targeted towards COVID-19 such that they could be included in this study. So what did they find? The patients all received remdesivir for 10 days, and then they were followed for 28 days until they were discharged from the hospital or until they died. And the primary outcome for the study was a, a clinical improvement. And I'll go through what that means on the next slide, because they actually had a quantitative way of tracking and diagnosing clinical improvement or lack thereof for the patients. In addition to clinical improvement, uh, discharge or a significant change in oxygenation did, change in oxygenation status were sort of lumped into that clinical improvement outcome. So that's the methodology. Um, you can note that there's no control group, there's no placebo, that this is just a cohort, an observational cohort of patients who received remdesivir uh, in the hospital. In terms of the clinical status scale, they had a six-point scale where the first stage was not hospitalized, so that includes the discharge from the hospital uh, over the course of their uh, illness. Um, they were hospitalized but not receiving oxygen, hospitalized needing oxygen, and then this is a bit of a jump up, needing high-flow nasal cannula or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which we talked about last time. We generally, currently, still are trying to avoid uh, positive pressure ventilation and, and maybe a little less so high-flow uh, high nasal cannula for our patients with COVID-19 to decrease the risk of aerosolization of the virus. Uh, so step five was that they needed mechanical ventilation or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO. And then step six was that they were dead. So this is the clinical status scale that they used for this study to quantify the change in oxygenation and the change in the patient's overall clinical status. And for a significant change, they quantified, the authors of the study quantified a two-point uh, improvement as a significant change in clinical status. So the methodology was on the prior slide, basically an observational study uh, looking at patients who received remdesivir for compassionate use. And then that primary outcome is delineated on this slide, a two-point change in this uh, kind of interesting ordinal clinical scale uh, that the authors set up. So what did they show? So about uh, two-thirds of the patients were intubated at the time of enrollment, uh, and the rest of them did need supplemental oxygen. 
so looking at our scale here, um, the patients were over on the right side of the screen in terms of needing some degree of oxygen and or mechanical ventilation. Remdesivir was started relatively late uh, in, the tr in the course of the patient's illness, about 12 days on average, uh, with an interquartile difference between 9 and 14, um, so relatively late in the course. Um, and then the patients generally improved. So 68% had a decrease in their oxygen requirement um, over the course of the 28 days of observation that they uh, underwent after receiving remdesivir. Okay. This is a table from the study from the New England Journal. And I just uh, bring your attention to the bottom row where it says improvement. And we can see the patients who started in the first column on invasive mechanical ventilation, over half of them demonstrated clinical improvement, a decrease in the need, uh, the degree of oxygenation required during the 28 day observation period. And there was improvement in every other arm as well. The, not, the patients who started on non-invasive ventilation, who started on lower flow oxygenation, or those who started on ambient air all demonstrated uh, some degree of improvement, ranging from 70 to 100%. Okay, so this seems, these are good things, right? Seeing improvement with this medication seems like something desirable. There were some adverse events, uh, but generally nothing uh, too catastrophic. Um, the, the most uh, serious adverse events were some patients developed uh, intracurrent septic shock, as you can see on the bottom line there. That was only 4% of the overall cohort. There was hypotension, renal dysfunction, then some minor adverse events such as rash diarrhea and then some increase in the transaminases. Part of the reason that they could not have transaminases of five times the upper limit of normal to be enrolled in the uh, remdesivir compassionate use study. So generally pretty well tolerated. So we see improvement in the oxygenation based on that six point clinical scale. We see relatively tolerable adverse events uh, attributable to or associated with remdesivir. So what's next? Well, there's some issues with the study, right? As I said before, there's no control group. And many uh, observers uh, and commentators on the study um, wonder if, if rather than looking at any sort of efficacy of remdesivir, we're just simply, the study is simply just a, a, a observational study of the natural progression of COVID-19 in a sick cohort of 54 patients. We can't attribute any change to remdesivir without a control group or a placebo uh, control uh, with which we can compare those patients to the control group. The course of treatment actually varied between patients. Well, there was a plan for 10 days of remdesivir. Um, the duration of treatment uh, was more variable than that. Uh, as I said, uh, patients started remdesivir about 12 days into their course of illness. So uh, they had symptoms, uh, got sick, ended up in the hospital, and then were started on remdesivir relatively late. And then probably most importantly of these four points that I've made so far, it's unclear where these patients really came from, how they were selected for compassionate use by Gilead and, and their physicians, um, you know, what resulted in them getting the medication. Uh, there's no clear sense of inclusion criteria for this study. Rather, it's uh, sort of a... Uh, a random sample of patients uh, with no selection uh, clarification as to how they ended up on the medication in the first place. Um, and then finally, there's the concern for bias, right? So the manuscript was written and edited with help from employees of the pharma company that produced remdesivir. And even in the era of best intentions, uh, there's certainly uh, the capacity for implicit uh, and unintentional bias uh, being introduced into the study when it's not the um, investigators who are the primary ones uh, writing up the study, methodology, results, conclusions, and meaning. So what do we do with this? So remdesivir was associated with improved oxygenation in this study in a small cohort of randomly selected patients uh, who received the drug for compassionate use, and relatively minimal and quite toler tolerable adverse effects, but has a lot of issues with regard to methodology and concern for bias. So the bottom line about remdesivir, uh, what I take away and many observers take away from this trial is this there's not compelling evidence from this observational cohort for using remdesivir on the front line. It's a little bit of a moot point because remdesivir is still not FDA approved. Again, it was used on a compassionate use basis. So it's not like we have it on our uh, formulary and we could provide it if we wanted to. But certainly this study uh, doesn't uh, uh, 
uh, push us to want to use remdesivir outside of the context of clinical trials as the second point there. Finally, the bottom point, uh, randomized trials going forward should provide some guidance about the utility or lack thereof uh, of remdesivir for COVID-19. So it's a little bit of a fuzzy bottom line, uh, but at least uh, we can take away from the study that was published in the New England Journal a couple of weeks ago um, that remdesivir does not seem to be the panacea or the magic bullet uh, to cure COVID-19, um, and that there's definitely more data coming down the road. All right, let's talk about hydroxychloroquine. Uh, this is another chest X-ray of a patient with pretty bad COVID-19 uh, pneumonia, not yet started on dialysis. Um, and our question uh, in the context of this and other patients is, what's the deal with hydroxychloroquine these days? Certainly been talking about it a lot over the past several weeks and months. Uh, so where do things stand? Well, we now have at least one randomized controlled trial of hydroxychloroquine uh, in patients with COVID-19. This is a preprint uh, of that trial. It's not been peer reviewed, um, it, as you can tell as you read through it. Um, but you know, it's some preliminary data uh, that will probably be refined uh, and augmented as it goes through the peer review process and actually gets published. And so we can look at it now. So this is a, a study from China. Uh, a trial from China uh, titled Hydroxychloroquine in Patients with COVID-19, an open-label randomized controlled trial. So what did they do? This is a multi-center, open-label, randomized controlled trial uh, in which about 150 patients uh, received hydroxychloroquine at a pretty high dose, 1,200 milligrams every day for three days, followed by 800 milligrams every day for two to three weeks. That's a lot of hydroxychloroquine. That is more than we have been using at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And I suspect if you're still using hydroxychloroquine, more than you've been using now with your patients. So you can't fault the authors for not giving enough hydroxychloroquine. They certainly uh, were not timid about providing a sub substantial dose of the medication to their, critical, or to their patients. Uh, patients similar to the remdesivir trial who had renal or hepatic disease were excluded from the hydroxychloroquine study. Um, and again, there was late in the course uh, addition of hydroxychloroquine to the patient's regimen. About 16 days uh, after onset of symptoms is when uh, the median time the patients were enrolled in this uh, study and were provided hydroxychloroquine again at those very high doses. Um, I, I, these patients may not be uh, quite as generalizable to the critical care population as the patients in the remdesivir trial, as they appear to have had relatively minor disease. They were hospitalized, um, but um, not particularly sick in general for, them, for the overall cohort. The primary outcome that they had was viral clearance at 28 days. So they were looking at a microbiological uh, laboratory-based outcome. Uh, they were doing uh, uh, RT-PCR on these patients uh, to quantify the degree of uh, replication, uh, the number of uh, viral uh, uh, molecules that were in the uh, patient's different cells. And basically, you can see the blue line uh, is the patients who received standard of care plus hydroxychloroquine, and the dotted red line was the patients who just received standard of care. And you can see the lines don't really cross. There is absolutely no difference in terms of the viral clearance or viral replication um, at 28 days or even for the last half of the 28-day uh, period. Okay, so viral clearance didn't really change, but what about symptoms? What about improvement uh, in the patient's clinical status, a uh, more patient-centered macroscopic outcome, if you will? Well, if we look at the y-axis here, it's a uh, cumulative improvement rate, looking at a variety of different symptoms that patients suffer from, uh, from COVID-19. And again, just no difference in the cumulative score. When they looked at some of the specific uh, individual symptoms, there was a little bit of signal demonstrating maybe a, a decreased time to resolution of fever, maybe uh, for patients who received hydroxychloroquine, but the overall cumulative symptom burden uh, no difference in these patients. So what do we do with this? There were some issues with this trial as well. It was unblinded. Uh, it was an uh, open trial, so patients and providers knew uh, if hydroxychloroquine was being provided or not. Um, it was interestingly performed not by the investigators, but by a contract research organization. So they basically contracted with somebody, uh, with a group who who runs uh, studies, um, and so this sort of third party actually ran the trial, which is a little bit of an odd methodology. It introduces the possibility 
bias, error, misinterpretation, et cetera. So kind of uh, furrow, furrow our brows at that and wonder what that's all about. Study was ended early. Um, they uh, had 150, 150 patients enrolled. Uh, they had intended to have more, but due to a uh, lack of any improvement, uh, they terminated it early. And then again, as with the remdesivir trial, there was a very long delay between symptom onset, 16 days, and actual initiation of treatment. That being said, this is a randomized controlled trial where patients uh, were uh, randomized to hydroxychloroquine or standard of care. Um, and so the rigorous methodology, I think, helps us really um, make a firm conclusion that hydroxychloroquine does not appear, based on this trial, to be effective treatment for COVID-19. And this conclusion that based on the available data, hydroxychloroquine doesn't seem to really work um, is underscored by guidelines from the Infectious Disease Society of America, um, who state, quote, among patients who have been admitted to the hospital with COVID-19, the IDSA or Infectious Disease Society of America guideline panel recommends hydroxychloroquine only in the context of a clinical trial. So um, our infectious disease experts are telling us don't just give hydroxychloroquine to patients anymore outside of a clinical trial. So yeah, it turns out that hydroxychloroquine a month ago, six weeks ago, we were all hoping that it was going to be effective for patients who had COVID-19. Based on this trial, based on these data, turns out that's not the case. So here at Beth Israel Deaconess, we're done giving hydroxychloroquine to patients with COVID-19 uh, in the ICU or other settings unless they're enrolled in a trial to assess for the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine um, to add to the uh, data out there in the literature, acknowledging that data is preprint and hasn't been peer reviewed yet, um, but still underscores uh, that hydroxychloroquine does not appear to be effective uh, in COVID-19 in the ICU or otherwise. All right, so we've covered remdesivir, we've covered hydroxychloroquine. Now we're going to move into uh, a different intervention uh, that we provide for our critically ill patients, which is uh, management of their volume status and their fluid status. And so the question is, how should we manage the volume status in critically ill patients with COVID-19? So we're going to go back uh, and talk about why this matters. Right. So in the literature from 2015, this is a, a snapshot of a figure from a, a study um, in which the authors essentially show that a positive fluid balance is associated with worse outcomes in critically ill patients. And you can see along the x-axis, we have the days in the ICU from one to seven. On the y-axis, we have the patient's fluid status. In the two different lines, the green line is patients who survived their critical illness uh, compared to patients in the blue dashed line who did not survive their critical illness. And look at that separation. Patients who survived their critical illness had a significantly lower fluid status at essentially every day of their hospitalization. And this indicates not a cause and effect, because this is a correlative study, but an association between decreased uh, fluid balance, uh, net even fluid balance, uh, and being fluid overloaded. And this has been borne out in multiple different studies, and I just show you another one of a couple hundred, 325 patients um, who were admitted to the ICU with shock. Uh, you can see the white boxes are survivors, the gray boxes are non-survivors, um, and you can see that the uh, survivors had a significantly lower fluid balance um, than the non-survivors, and that a positive fluid balance of multivariate analysis was independently predictive of mortality with the odds ratio of 1.66, as you see there, and a significant p-value, indicating, again, not cause and effect um, from these data, but an association between having a lot of fluid on board and worse outcomes, including mortality. Okay. So fluid matters for our critically ill patients, including our critically ill patients with COVID-19. So what do we do with fluid balance for these patients? Well, first, we, we go back to our basic uh, physiology and pathophysiology, and we realize that there are times when we do have to administer fluids. If we look at the y-axis being cardiac output or stroke volume, and then the x-axis being preload, uh, LV, EBV, or uh, left ventricular and diastolic volume or pressure, um, if we have a patient who's starting out on his or her starling curve and they become hypovolemic so that their preload drops, that may affect their cardiac output, particularly if they've maximized their contractility. And so, yeah, in this instance, we would give fluid back. That's the appropriate clinical, clinically indicated thing to do. 
However, sometimes we get a little exuberant and maybe we get a little bit more fluid than we ought to, such that the patient can pass that threshold for developing elevated left-sided heart pressures, increased pulmonary hydrostatic pressures, uh, and, and transudation of fluid from the pulmonary capillaries into the pulmonary parenchyma. That can affect gas exchange, that can affect ventilation, pulmonary mechanics, and that can make things worse for the patient uh, as he or she, she's trying to recuperate uh, from their clinical course, from their critical illness, and can increase morbidity and mortality as we talked about on the last few slides. We showed this slide uh, last time. This is from uh, Michael Maffey's uh, excellent review of ARDS from 20 years ago in 2000, and, uh, uh, from the year 2000. Um, but the pathophysiology and the mechanisms of lung injury still hold up today. This is the normal alveolus on the left side, and then this is our inflamed, angry, uh, poorly functional alveolus. And again, uh, I'd highlight that you have this increase in capillary permeability that allows for fluid to leak into the pulmonary uh, parenchyma. Uh, it can cause decreased respiratory system compliance. The fluid can leak into the alveoli that can cause issues with gas exchange and oxygen uptake. And this is happening at baseline. And if we add more fluid to the patient's uh, circulatory system, we increase the left-sided pressures and the pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure, that can just make a bad situation worse. So we want to be cognizant of and think carefully about fluid balance, fluid administration, and diuresis for our patients with COVID-19, sepsis, and multi-organ system failure. So how do we do that? Well, we go back to the literature. And this is another trial, this one published in the New England Journal in 2006, that can help guide us in terms of how to best manage our COVID-19 patients in the ICU. The fluid and catheter treatment trial, or the FACT trial as it's called, uh, was a, a two by two uh, factorial design trial in which the authors looked both at volume status and specifically randomizing patients to a conservative volume status uh, in which they targeted a low central venous pressure uh, and or a low pulmonary artery occlusion pressure uh, versus a liberal fluid strategy um, in which they randomized patients uh, to a uh, CVP of 10 to 14 and a higher pulmonary artery occlusion pressure of 14 to 18. Another part of this trial that we don't talk about as much these days was that patients were also randomized to receive a simple central line or a Swangans or PA line uh, to measure their pulmonary artery occlusion pressures. Um, that's less relevant uh, to our management of COVID-19 patients. Um, so I'm just going to focus on the fluid management component of uh, uh, this trial uh, as, in terms of relevant outcomes. So patients were randomized either to the conservative strategy or the liberal strategy. And you can see at the bottom of the screen, there was a mar marked differentiation in terms of the fluid balance at seven days between the two groups. Those in the conservative strategy were essentially even for length of stay, a little bit negative. Even. And the patients who were in the liberal strategy, they were saturated. They were seven liters up uh, on average over the course of seven days in the ICU. So big differ differentiation between the two groups in terms of the volume status. But what about patient-centered outcomes? What about things like mortality and length of stay? Well, it turns out that mortality did not differ between the two arms uh, with regard to um, uh, conservative versus liberal strategy. And you can see the numbers there, 25% uh, for the conservative arm, 28% for the liberal arm. Uh, so fluid management with a p-value of 0.3 didn't really affect mortality. There was, interestingly and, and plausibly, a difference between ventilator-free days between the two arms, about uh, two and a half days less uh, mechanical ventilation for the conservative fluid arm versus the liberal uh, fluid arm. And if we go back to our understanding of the pathophysiology of ARDS, that, that makes sense. If the lungs are wetter, more edematous, heavier, less compliant, and have worsened gas exchange by having more fluid on board, then it's going to take longer to get them off to, to get patients off of the, the ventilator. So this makes sense mechanistically. So we don't see mortality benefit, but we see a decrease in the ventilator free, uh, the, the days required for mechanical ventilation, and increase in the ventilator free days. All right, so what do we see here? So other results from uh, the FACT trial, uh, there's a significant difference in ICU free days. Um, uh, I think I have the labels reversed there. So there was less, uh, uh, patients were free from the ICU more frequently in the conservative arm compared to the liberal arm. So it was a good thing to be in the conservative arm. 
time. Uh, the oxygenation inde index, uh, the formula for which I put up the, in the blue writing there, and lung injury scores were improved uh, for patients who were in the conservative arm. And there was no difference in the need for renal replacement therapy or an incidence of shock for these patients. So if you're concerned about diuresing patients and precipitating renal injury or hypertension, they didn't see that in the fact trial, which gives us some reassurance about providing patients um, with diuretics to try to de-resuscitate them and keep them close to an even fluid status. So what's the bottom line about volume status for our patients with COVID-19, multi-organ system failure, septic shock, and acute respiratory distress syndrome? Well, number one, if we wanna keep them towards an even volume status, we should not be providing maintenance fluids. That's definitely a, a contraindicated in these patients and, and not appropriate. Um, it just leads to increased uh, soft tissue uh, fluid and particularly worsened uh, pulmonary edema. And we should use diuretics. Sometimes we tend to be a little tentative about diuretics, um, but when patients are getting fluid overloaded uh, to address that increased pulmonary edema and that positive volume status, uh, we should use diuretics uh, to try to provide uh, them an even fluid status going forward. Of course, if we see signs of real injury, if their creatinine is rising, or they have an active urine, urine sediment, um, or if they're uh, hypotensive, then it's appropriate uh, to hold off on diuretics until we uh, figure out what's going on with their kidneys and or, and or cardiocirculatory status. Um, it's worth emphasizing that the FACT trial did not enroll patients uh, who are in shock. Um, it, they could be on vasopressors, but signs of multi-organ system failure or shock was an exclusion criteria from enrolling. And so we want to be thoughtful about uh, targeted diuresis for our patients who are hemodynamically uh, in, a, in an acceptable hemodynamic state uh, without uh, progressive worsening acute kidney injury. But the bottom line from this is we're targeting ideally an even fluid status uh, for our critically ill patients. All right, so we covered remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, and fluid status for our patients uh, with COVID-19, multi-organ system failure, and septic shock and acute respiratory distress syndrome. What about when they get better? So we've heard uh, through social media and some anecdotal reports and the experience of people in New York, Washington, uh, Italy, and China about maybe there's a sign of, of increased post-extubation laryngeal edema for these patients with COVID-19 and prolonged courses of mechanical ventilation and prolonged ICU length of stays. So is that true? Are they at increased risk for post-extubation laryngeal edema? And if so, what should we do about it? So first off, what is post-extubation laryngeal edema and why does it matter? The literature on this is quite variable. Um, there is a uh, review slash meta-analysis uh, that was published in Critical Care Medicine in 2015 uh, that went through the available literature at that time and, and basically uh, reports the, the, the uh, spectrum of post-extubation laryngeal edema and the importance of it is all over the place, right? So the incidence of post-extubation laryngeal edema varies widely from 5 to 55% based on the available literature. Strider, so a, a macroscopic clinical representation of post-extubation laryngeal edema also varies from 1.5 to 26% in the available reports. And then finally, the most important consequence of post-extubation laryngeal edema, uh, reintubation, having to put the tube down because the uh, glottis, the uh, retinoids, the vocal cords collapse uh, so forcibly, uh, occurs quite widely. So some reports, uh, some case series uh, indicate about 10% of patients who develop post-extubation laryngeal edema uh, need to be reintubated. Uh, another case theory has demonstrated that 100% of patients who were found to have post-extubation laryngeal edema needed to be intubated, uh, re-intubated. Um, so the numbers are, are all over the place out there. But the important take home from this variability is that it happens and it matters. So we may not have the precise incidence and the precise rate of reintubation, but it happens and it matters and we have to be aware of it. This is a picture, uh, two pictures, one of uh, normal vocal cords on the left, a normal larynx, a uh, wide open glottis, normal arenoids. Um, and then on the right uh, from critical care medicine, uh, 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 
of manuscript documenting issues with an incidence of post-extubation laryngeal edema, you can see how swollen and edematous the vocal cords are, a marked differentiation. And you can just think about how difficult it would be to get an endotracheal tube down through that small uh, microscopic opening between these edematous cords and the retinoids. Um, and so I like this picture or this comparison because it really, I think, drives home um, how uh, catastrophic post-extubation laryngeal edema can be and the importance of being vigilant for uh, assessing for it and then managing it uh, if it's uh, detected prior to extubating the patient. We'll go through what that means in a second. First, what are the risk factors for post-extubation laryngeal edema? From the review and meta-analysis published in Critical Care Medicine in 2015, um, these are the five major categories uh, in which uh, patients uh, can be at risk for developing post-extubation laryngeal edema. And we'll go through these categories and then specific um, subcategories or, or specific parameters associated with each. In terms of thinking about the endotracheal tube, things that can result in post-extubation laryngeal edema is having a large endotracheal tube that's pressing against the vocal cords and the retinoids, uh, causing the mechanical trauma and increased risk for capillary leak and swelling into the larynx itself. Um, sort of related to that, the ratio of the tube size, not side, uh, tube size to laryngeal size of greater than 45% is a specific metric, um, as well as prolonged intubation and high cuff pressures. All that makes sense. If you have a large tube or high cuff pressures in the airway for a fair amount of time, there's more likelihood of a mechanical trauma, which can lead to swelling uh, and then an increased risk for edema, strider, and need for reintubation after the tube's pulled out. Um, airway parameters, uh, we think of as well. So if there's a small airway, uh, which is more frequently associated with female gender and a small height to endotracheal tube diameter, those things can all increase the risk of developing post-extubation laryngeal edema. Uh, similar to that, short neck and, and uh, airway pathology, such as tracheomalacia, uh, can result in increased risk of edema as well. I think these make intuitive sense. It's similar to having a large tube, high pressures in the airway, pressing against the larynx, the vocal cords, the arytenides uh, over a fair amount of time. Um, all of this feeds into the increased risk for trauma and edema. Um, if we look at uh, specific airway trauma, if patients had, have had multiple intubation attempts, you can imagine that the endotracheal tube, as it's trying to pass through the cords, is banging against the vocal cords, banging against the retinoids, again, precipitating injury, swelling, capillary leak, edema, and increased risk for uh, uh, airway trauma um, and post-extubation laryngeal edema. Self-extubation fits into this. Uh, if patients pull an inflated balloon uh, through their vocal cords, that can be similarly traumatic uh, and can result in injury swelling in this cycle of uh, post-extubation uh, strider and edema uh, with risk of needing to be reintubated. Uh, patient level parameters uh, that may be associated with post-extubation laryngeal edema in addition to female gender, short neck, short height, include older age, obesity, um, and patients who are under sedated, and that may be because they're coughing, uh, they're trying to contract their vocal cords against the endotracheal tube uh, that can result in trauma and swelling. Obesity similar, more tissue externally resulting in uh, more pressure internally uh, that can increase the risk of having the original edema. And then finally, medical patients who are sicker um, have an increased risk for post-extubation laryngeal edema. You'll see in uh, the slides uh, that I've gone through, I've highlighted several of the parameters in red. Those are the ones that I think are particularly pertinent to our COVID-19 patients. They tend to be sicker. They tend to be intubated for longer courses than five to seven days. Um, they tend to need to be reintubated. Uh, several of our patients uh, just this week when we extubated them, unfortunately had to be reintubated because they weren't quite ready uh, to breathe on their own despite passing spontaneous breathing trials and seeming as if they were uh, good to go. So all those things, I think, are particularly pertinent for our COVID-19 patients uh, that increase their risk for post-extubation laryngeal edema. And a lot of our patients end up getting prone. So does proning increase the risk of post-extubation laryngeal edema and swelling around the glottis? And this one is a little bit up in the air. We're not quite sure if proning is an independent risk factor. 
from spinal surgery uh, literature where patients are uh, placed supine and, and operated on for sometimes hours on end. There doesn't appear to be an increased risk for post-extubation laryngeal edema, um, but our COVID-19 patients are obviously prone for a lot longer uh, than patients in the spinal surgery, surgery literature. From the seminal study, the PROCEVA study that was published in the New England Journal in 2013, uh, in which patients were randomized to proning or not proning, there was not a reported uh, a signal of increased risk of post-extubation laryngeal edema. Um, so proning probably doesn't increase the risk independent of other risk factors, but these COVID-19 patients certainly have a lot of other risk factors for post-extubation laryngeal edema. So we do want to be vigilant about and assess for uh, patients uh, uh, developing this complication. So what can we do to assess for post-extubation laryngeal edema? You've all probably heard of a qualitative cuff leak test. And, and what I've got here is a diagram showing an endotracheal tube uh, in the trachea here. These are supposed to be the vocal cords and these are the arytenoids. Uh, um, and we can see that the uh, air is coming in uh, here, going down into the airways. And this uh, balloon around the endotracheal tube is keeping air from sneaking out, uh, going through the uh, larynx and out the mouth, right? So the balloon is intended uh, to ensure that all of the tidal volume that we deliver uh, goes down into the lower respiratory tract, that it goes down into the airways themselves. Um, over here, uh, we've now deflated the balloon. You can see it's uh, uh, not pressing against the tracheal walls. And so now some air can escape through the glottis. Um, and usually there's some secretions that pool there. And if we listen carefully at the glottis, we can hear those secretions sort of bubbling as air percolates through. Um, and that's our qualitative uh, cuff leak test. And if we have a patient who now has very swollen uh, vocal cords, a very swollen arytenoid, you can compare this is a normal vocal cords and arytenoid, this is a very swollen vocal cords and arytenoids, you can see that that could potentially stop air from going uh, up out of the larynx, uh, from going around the endotracheal tube. And so you may not hear that qualitative cuff leak, that sort of ronkerous, uh, uh, sonorous sound as air bubbles through uh, the secretions that have collected at the larynx around the level of the vocal cords. At least that's the idea. It turns out that the uh, uh, qualitative cuff leak uh, test is not particularly sensitive or specific. Um, it uh, does not really accurately predict patients who are going to be at increased risk of developing post-extubation laryngeal, laryngeal edema, strider, or the need for reintubation. We still tend to do it, and if we don't detect uh, a qualitative cuff leak, if we don't hear uh, that sonorous, raucous uh, gurgling in the upper airway, sometimes we'll pause on excavating the patients. But if you do hear that sonorous, raucous uh, sound of the qualitative cuff leak test, it's not a very good guarantee that the patient won't have complications post-extubation. One can perform a quantitative cuff leak test on our COVID-19 patients who are intubated in the ICU. And uh, the process for that's delineated here. Essentially, you take the patient and you have to put them back on volume control ventilation where we're delivering a set tidal volume. You then deflate the endotracheal tube cuff, uh, as we demonstrated in the uh, prior screen here. So the cuff uh, goes down. And then you measure the expiratory volume. Remember, expiratory volume is measured through the endotracheal tube. So if there's air escaping around the endotracheal tube, um, then it's not going to be measured. And, and that will be the, the, the leak, if you will, uh, of the quantitative cuff leak test. And so again, at the bottom, I put the quantitative cuff leak is the set tidal volume minus the measured expiratory volume when the cuff is deflated. And this is a, a more accurate and probably more sensitive way to actually detect again, quantitatively for a cuff leak, as opposed to the qualitative, just listening to hear if you uh, appreciate any gurgling around the vocal cords. And there's a little bit of guidance from the literature uh, that demonstrates that either using a, a cutoff uh, of the quantitative cuff leak of 110 cc's, or what we tend to use uh, to make it more individualized and patient-centered, a cuff leak of less than 20% of the set tidal volume um, as kind of a, a cutoff for a positive versus negative quantitative cuff leak. So the patients at increased risk for post-extubation laryngeal edema, um, if less than 20% of the air delivered uh, goes out around the endotracheal tube through the vocal cords, 
Um, and so for those patients, you may actually want to pause on uh, extubating them and provide treatment to try to decrease the risk of developing post-extubation laryngeal edema. And you can see uh, from the available literature, which is pretty minimal, um, there's a pooled sensitivity of about 56% and a pooled specificity of about 92%. So if the uh, quantitative cuff leak um, is negative, it doesn't necessarily uh, if it's negative, then you're at increased concern for the patient uh, developing post-extubation laryngeal edema. Um, if it's positive, that isn't a guarantee that they're going to be able to, uh, that they're not going to have issues post-extubation. So neither of these tests are perfect, but they're good to know about and use in selected patients who have increased risk of developing post-extubation laryngeal edema. So what do you do if you detect it? So if you perform a quantitative cuff leak and they do not um, have a leak of, of more than 20% of the delivered tidal volume. And you're concerned about the, uh, them having significant swelling around the larynx, the vocal cords, the arytenoids. Leukocorticoids have been studied uh, pretty extensively uh, for decreasing the risk of post-extubation laryngeal edema and strider. And just to synthesize uh, what really is a, a lot of studies uh, and different protocols into two different uh, considerations. It seems that, based on the available literature, you can get away with giving a single dose of methylprednisolone, 40 milligrams IV, about four hours prior to extubation. And that seems to be sufficient uh, from a study that was published about eight years ago now, uh, in 2011. There are a lot of different steroid protocols out there for post-extubation laryngeal edema, including giving it over 48 to, uh, 24 to 48 hours, multiple doses. But again, it seems that a single dose four hours before extubating is probably not inferior to those other protocols. Something we probably would not do for our patients with COVID-19 would be to deliver inhaled budesonide. It's nebulized, it increases the risk of aerosolizing the virus. Um, and this protocol from the study uh, by Abbasi and colleagues in 2014 um, is over a 48 hour period, which is kind of a, a, a long um, uh, protocol for somebody who you think is otherwise ready to extubate. So of these two, when we suspect post-extubation laryngeal edema, um, we'll favor giving the single dose of methylprednisone. You do want to do your due diligence of a qualitative and or quantitative cuff leak uh, to try to identify the increased risk for this uh, in, in the patients with selected risk factors. Um, because giving steroids capriciously to patients who have viral uh, ARDS and sepsis isn't something that we want to do. So we do it in the select patients who meet the criteria who are at increased risk for developing post-extubation laryngeal edema. All right, uh, so we've covered remdesivir, we've covered hydroxychloroquine, we've covered fluid management in our patients with COVID-19 ARDS and sepsis, and we've covered uh, the, the assessment of uh, risk factors for assessment of and treatment for uh, post-extubation laryngeal edema. Now we're getting uh, pretty far from the evidence uh, with our final question, which is what is the role for systemic anticoagulation for critically ill patients with COVID-19? As I'm sure many of you have experienced, uh, these patients tend to be quite hypercoagulable by the time they get to the ICU and have developed uh, acute respiratory failure, maybe acute renal failure, maybe cardiocirculatory collapse requiring pressors. Um, by the point, time they get to that point, they're hyperinflammatory. Uh, they have severe sepsis and sometimes septic shock, and they can be they can have a tendency uh, towards thrombogenesis. And so, what do we do? So the bottom line is we don't know. Uh, we're not sure. Uh, there is not a deep literature about uh, systemic anticoagulation for critically ill patients with COVID-19. Um, looking at ARDS in general, um, there have been prior studies looking at anticoagulation because ARDS is characterized by fiber deposition and thrombogenesis uh, in the pulmonary circulation, as we saw from that prior slide and as we talked about in the last session. But the studies looking at anticoagulation uh, have not been as rigorous as one might like and are generally heterogeneous with regard to both methods and results. There are some positive studies in ARDS demonstrating benefit of systemic anticoagulation, but there are other studies that don't demonstrate benefit. And so it's a heterogeneous literature that doesn't unfortunately provide us with real targeted guidance on the appropriateness or the indications for systemic anticoagulation. The current clinical practice guidelines from professional organizations like the Society of Critical Care Medicine and the American Thoracic Society do not support empiric systemic anticoagulation or thrombolysis for patients with ARDS in general. All right, 
So it sounds like what we're getting from the limited literature and the clinical practice guidelines is we shouldn't anticoagulate everybody. But maybe there are some patients who might benefit from systemic anticoagulation. Well, let's see what we got. From the literature that's available, there's a retrospective study of about 450 patients at a single medical center, um, who, some of whom did receive systemic anticoagulation. This was not a randomized trial. Um, the patients who did receive anticoagulation were the minority of those included in this retrospective analysis. And as you can see, the punchline uh, at the bottom of the screen, there is no difference in mortality between the two different groups. Those retrospectively assessed patients who did or did not receive systemic anticoagulation um, for uh, their COVID-19 uh, illness. They looked at some subgroups, and for the 99 patients who received either low molecular rate heparin or unfractionated heparin, for patients who had a high sepsis-induced coagulopathy score, which is a clinical scoring system looking at a variety of different laboratory and clinical parameters, for patients who had an increased uh, sepsis-induced coagulopathy score, um, those patients did have decreased mortality, significantly decreased mortality, compared to patients who did not receive anticoagulation. And the same was seen in the subgroup of patients who had a very elevated D-dimer uh, level as compared to patients uh, who did not receive systemic anticoagulation. You can see the numbers there, a significant difference in mortality uh, for patients who were anticoagulated in these retrospectively assessed subgroups of this cohort uh, from a single medical center in China. Okay, so not the most rigorous uh, evidence in the world, but potentially a little signal in there about uh, targeted benefit for some patients uh, with COVID-19 and, and septic shock. As always, uh, there's some issues with this study. Um, correlation does not equal causation. This was not a randomized trial, so we can't attribute benefit uh, to systemic anticoagulation, but it's a hypothesis generating result um, that may will certainly inform future trials and may inform our clinical practice currently. It's not clear uh, exactly how sick these patients were with regard to their acute respiratory failure because the authors did not provide any details, including need for mechanical ventilation or oxygen requirements. So it's hard to know how to generalize this or to whom we should generalize uh, these results. And it's uh, unclear why they chose six times the upper limit of normal as their cutoff for the D-dimer assay. That's not explained in the manuscript. Um, and so it seems a little bit, if not a lot, arbitrary. We um, are operationalizing this um, in our medical center and, and in talking to other people around the country and the world. Um, it seems that others also are developing uh, protocols based on the best available evidence uh, to understand when and for whom to provide systemic anticoagulation for patients with COVID-induced acute respiratory distress syndrome. And you can see our flowchart there is to consider therapeutic anticoagulation for patients who have both severe hypoxic respiratory failure and hypercoagulability. Um, and the way that um, one can assess hypercoagulability is by an elevated D-dimer. Nobody knows what the cutoff for elevated should be. A uh, thromboelastogram that shows uh, hypercoagulability or just your clinical acumen or suspicion. Um, so this is kind of a framework that we see people using uh, out there, not evidence-based, uh, but kind of trying to channel uh, the results of that retrospective study uh, from China, as well as our understanding of the heterogeneous literature on anticoagulation and ARDS. Um, different treatment approaches can include unfractionated heparin, which uh, tends to be, I think, the most commonly used anticoagulant, certainly in our ICU for patients who are hypercoagulable with COVID. Um, anoxaparin is a, obviously another option, DOAX, et cetera. Um, and then some centers are using salvage thrombolysis uh, with tissue plasminogen activator if the PaO2, the FiO2 is consistently less than 100 for patients who have all those indices of hypercoagulability. Again, this is under the auspices of a clinical trial at our medical center, and I'm sure other places are studying this as well, but there's no high level evidence uh, to, to truly support that. It seems that people are making the best of, of what's out there to try to create some sort of uh, context uh, and pathway for using systemic anticoagulation and or lysis. So the bottom line, again, about systemic anticoagulation for these patients with COVID-19 is that we're not sure. Um, but uh, again, from the available literature, people are putting together protocols and trying to uh, make the best out of what uh, we do know about this disease process.
So these were our objectives in terms of our time together today, talking about remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine, uh, for both of which there does not appear to be uh, compelling evidence about their efficacy, um, and certainly for hydroxychloroquine, uh, we do not recommend using that uh, as therapy uh, for COVID-19 at this time. We talked about fluid management strategies and referenced the uh, seminal FACT trial from the New England Journal in 2006, uh, targeting an even fluid status, uh, decreases time on the ventilator, decreases likely to stay in the ICU, um, although does not reach the level of impacting mortality. Talked about post-extubation laryngeal edema, uh, what risk factors are for it, uh, including duration of mechanical, long duration of mechanical ventilation. Talked about how to assess it with a qualitative cuff leak test that isn't particularly sensitive or specific, um, and a quantitative cuff leak test, which is certainly more specific. Um, and then how to treat it with a single dose of methylprednisolone, 40 milligrams IV. And then finally, we talked about the role for systemic anticoagulation in pretty highly selected patients who are hypercoagulable uh, with acute respiratory failure uh, due to COVID-19. Um, this is uh, just a summary of what we talked about today, uh, reviewing what I just went through uh, on the objective slide. Um, and uh, we'll pause there for questions if anybody has any. Thank you for your time, attention, and engagement. Uh, and Dr. Tucker, uh, anything that we can address in the last couple few minutes here? Sure, thank you for an excellent presentation. And there were a lot of questions that came up in the chat box. Uh, a lot of the questions, however, unfortunately, fairly complicated. So I'm gonna try to <laughs> use a few questions that I think you might be able to answer fairly succinctly. Um, 